Good morning, Pastor Brad from Emmanuel. It's good to see you with us again today. It's been two weeks since we've been together. We met this last week at church. We had a special guest speaker, and uh, that was a blessing. We're in the Gospel of John. We're moving towards the end. It's hard to believe we're getting to the end of this uh, Gospel, and it's been a blessing. We have encountered really the greatest message of all, uh, Jesus Christ. We've looked at him specifically. He is the very Son of God, and we're, we're seeing that here in this text. This morning, we're, we're going to take a summary look at uh, the Gospel of John. What is the, what is the purpose? Well, we've been, we've been looking at that purpose all the way through. Today, we finally encounter these two verses here in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And so let's uh, look at those together. Let me read that. Now, John did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This becomes the purpose statement for the whole Gospel of John. Everything that he's done, everything that he's revealed to us, it goes back to these words right here. It's to reveal Jesus Christ. And so I want us to look at that. What is revealed about Christ? What is revealed about Christ? Well, the first thing that we see is this. Christ displays the very power of God. Now, when Christ comes, he makes it very clear. Everything that he does, he does for the purpose of the Father, to reveal the works of the Father. His ministry is about revealing the Father, the power of his Father, the power of God. But not only that, we see the power of Jesus Christ. We see manifested the deity of Jesus Christ himself. Not only is his Father God Almighty, but he himself is God Almighty. We have one God, but three persons. And Jesus Christ comes to reveal God the Father. And he reveals to a, to a waiting world, to a world who needs a Savior, that God has come in the flesh, and it is in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, in chapter 30, of 20, verse 30, we see this. Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written about in this, in this book. And so what we see here is this. Um, we see the ministry of Jesus Christ. We see, seven, we see seven signs that are revealed in this book. Signs are, are uh, Jesus is revealed and shown to us by John. He does his work, his work, his miracles, his signs and wonders are for a purpose. They're not just to heal. They're not just to be a, a miracle worker just to entertain the people. They reveal something about who Jesus Christ is. They reveal something about his relationship to his Father. So let's look at those. John chapter 2, the very first sign that we see, his very first miracle, as it were, his very first step into public ministry after his baptism, is to turn water into wine. Jesus reveals in this first miracle that he's on a divine schedule. He says, his mother Mary says to him, at the wedding here, we, we're running out of, out of wine. That, it can't happen. And so he, she says to the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. And he says, woman, what does this have to do with me? What does this have to do with my divine, sovereign timetable? The timetable that, that is laid upon him to go to the cross as our Savior, to redeem us from sin. So this first miracle reveals this. Everything that he will do, he will do for the glory of God. That comes out of these verses here. Everything that he will do is intended to bring, is to bring men, women, and children to faith in Jesus Christ. Here, the disciples believed in him because of the work that he did. His works are intended to, to take the Jew back to the Old Testament, to remind them of what was done and what's being fulfilled in him. They would have, they would have, they would have remembered Moses when Moses was uh, leading the people through the wilderness. God provided water through a rock. Moses hit that rock with his staff, and water poured out in provision for the people. And now Jesus Christ turns water into wine. Chapter 4, we see this. We see a royal official's son healed. He's a Roman official. We don't know exactly where he works. Could be with Pontius Pilate. Could be with King Antipodus. We don't know for sure. But he's, he is a, a, works for the government of Rome, a royal official. His son is 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 on this, his deathbed. He comes to Jesus Christ. Jesus says, you've come to me because I'm a, I'm a miracle worker, basically. You Galileans, right? And, and, and you from Galilee. Whatever the reason he came, yes, because he's distraught, yes, because his son needs healing, Jesus Christ extends grace and love and he heals. 
and he reveals to the to the Jews, he is one who has power over disease. Distance is no barrier to his ability to work. They would have remembered Elijah and Elisha did he were did healing in their ministries, but they never did it over a distance like Jesus Christ did. Distance was no barrier. Jesus was here. The Son was here. Jesus simply simply willed it to be done, and it was done, and He was healed. We see in, in John chapter 5, we see a paralyzed man is healed. A man who's paralyzed from birth. Jesus is victorious, victorious over this barrier, over this physical limitation. Uh, Jesus Christ comes and reveals His ability to handle disease. They would have remembered Elisha. And Elisha, he had this ministry of healing. In fact, one who, was, who encountered Elisha was sent to, into the Jordan River and dipped seven times and came up healed. Yet Jesus Christ fulfills that and, and, and shows us His power here. He's victorious over, over disease that can be healed by others. That's the power Jesus has. Chapter 6, we see 5,000 people are fed. Of course, they come to Him because He's a miracle worker. They come because they've been following Him all day, listening to His message, wanting to learn, but wanting to see Him do something. Maybe they had sick that needed to be healed. That's not, of course, communicated in this. And uh, But what Jesus does is he, is he miraculously, from a few fish and a few loaves of bread, He, from His own hand, he produces and he produces and he produces and he feed and he produces enough food for not only five thousand men but for the wives and children to be fed as well. And he just reminds us, and he says to you and I this morning, "I am sufficient for the needs of your life. I am sufficient for your physical needs, and I am sufficient for your spiritual needs in your life." They would have thought of Moses when God provided manna to Israel. They would have remembered that. God is the provider of all provision, our food. Jesus Christ fulfills that here. John chapter 6, we see Jesus walk on water. The disciples are caught in a, in a horrible storm on the Sea of Galilee. They come up suddenly. They're violent. They can be deadly. These are hardened fishermen, and yet they are terrified that they're going to lose their life. And Jesus... Jesus appears to them and he calms the waters and he calms the sea, calms the winds. And he has he has all authority over the waters, the wave, the wind. Of course so it makes sense. He created all things, did he not? From the power of his word, his spoken word, he created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter one. And Jesus Christ here has authority over all those elements and he simply controls them. And with the word he stops them and controls them. They would have remembered Jesus. They would have remembered Moses dividing the waters under the power of God. But Moses never walked on the water, did he? Jesus Christ is able to walk on the water here. We see a man born blind. This is this is the impossible miracle. No one was able to help this man. All the doctors and all their wisdom, maybe in all the cultures, who know, are unable to help this man blind from birth. Jesus comes and he's the giver of sight. The giver of physical sight, the giver of spiritual sight. He changes this man. And he reminds, the sign here is a reminder to you and I that nothing is impossible with God. When we come to Him by faith for that first time, we are reminded nothing is impossible with Him. If He can change us, He can change anybody, right? He can change this world. He's the agent of change in this world. Lazarus, we encounter Lazarus. He's raised from the dead. Our greatest enemy is death. We have no power over death. We can't control death. All of us will die unless the Lord comes first. We have no power over it. It doesn't matter how much money we have. It doesn't matter how much power we have in this world. We have no power over death. Jesus has ultimate power over death. He gave us life and He, and he won that victory over death first. He laid down His life and He took it up again. Here He raises Lazarus from the dead. They would have remembered Elisha. What an unusual... In 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 20 and 21, what an unusual moment we see in the Old Testament. A man is running from robbers. A group is running from robbers. And uh, one of them dies, and he, they throw him into the, into the grave where Elisha happens to be buried, and he touches Elisha's bones, and he rises from the dead right there. Well, of course, God has that ability. It wasn't Elijah. It was God through Elijah's bones. Jesus is the one who has power over death. He reveals that in his ministry. Jesus, the authority of Jesus, the power of Jesus Christ, 
is revealed over and over again here by John. Jesus has all power. He has all authority over sin and disease. There is nothing in this world and nothing in your life that Jesus can't overcome. He has all power to transform, to change. He has all power to love us when we're unlovable. We see Jesus Christ here with all authority and all power. John is clear to communicate that and to show that to us. Jesus Christ is the very Son of God. In fact, we see that. The next element that is summarized in, the, in these two verses is this, is, is the deity of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father. He came, all of His words, all of His works, His timetable was the Father's. Everything He did was in submission to the Father. And yet, at the same time, what was being revealed was the very deity of, the, of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the very Son of God, and that you would have life in His name. It's His name. His name is sufficient because He is God. His name has power because He's God. His name is authority because He's God. He is the promised Messiah. He is the Christ, the promised Anointed One to come. Well, we see from the words in the mouth of Jesus Himself, seven expressions of deity here in John. He says, I am the bread of life. I am your spiritual nourishment. He is the one to, that changes our life. We don't live unless we eat. When we're dead, we can't eat. When we're in our sin and we're dead, we can't eat. When He raises us to life, then He becomes, in that moment, the spiritual nourishment that sustains us in that, in that moment of life through all eternity. We must feed our souls every day on the Word of God. We're called to read His Word, to let it pour into our life to give us the strength and the grace that we need. And when we go into a day without feeding on the Word of God, we go into a day malnourished, without power, weak, vulnerable, and we don't have to be. We're to take in spiritual nourishment every day. Jesus is that nourishment. He's the bread of life. When we feed upon His resources in our life, when we bring them into our life, we have power. We have strength. We are healthy in Jesus Christ. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. He pierces the darkness. We are in a dark world. It is dark all around us. The news and the social media and everything that we encounter is darkness. Our world is in chaos. Sin is rampant. It is everywhere. All of us are born into darkness because of sin. Without Jesus Christ, we live in darkness. It is suffocating. There is, there is no ability to, to gain eternal meaning. There is no, there is no ability to, to, to rise or lift ourselves up from our own problems. We are in darkness. We are helpless. We are powerless. We're unable to see what is truly meaningful. We're unable to see what we need to see to experience the peace of God for the first time until Jesus touches our life by grace and gives us the faith to see for the first time the person of Jesus Christ. He pierces our darkness with His light, and He reveals the sin in our life. And yet when He touches our life with that, with, that, with that piercing light, we are touched by the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And we see the, the dirtiness of our sin, and we see the severity of our need and the total depravity of who we are. And then our eyes are lifted up by faith to Jesus Christ, to the cross, to the work He did. And in that moment, we are healed. And our perspective changes for all eternity. He is the light of the world. He is truth. We see that. He is the door. There is no entrance into heaven. There is no entrance into relationship with God the Father except to be through Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the door. No one comes in unless they go through the door. And He says, I am the door. His name is everything. It is His name that is power. It is His name that gives us access. There are, there are restaurants and there are clubs and there are, there are uh, places that you can go where you can only gain entrance if you know a name. If your name is on that list and your name is not on that list unless you know the person who is in charge. And there is no way under heaven you're going to get into that event unless you know that person. There is no way under heaven we can gain access to, to heaven in relationship with Him unless the, the name of Jesus Christ is stamped on our heart. He says, I am the door. We gain access into relationship through Jesus Christ. Otherwise, we are separated and we are, we are alienated. He says, I am the good shepherd. Everything about Jesus Christ is good. He is the loving caregiver of our life. He meets our needs. He, he goes before us. He walks ahead of us. He knows the needs before we encounter them. And He's sufficient for every need. 
He gave his life for the sheep. He gave his life for us. He is the one who is our shepherd. He takes care of us. And yet as a shepherd, he met our greatest need. Our greatest need was death. Our greatest need was sin, the consequence of sin, which is spiritual death. And he met that head on by giving his life. He died for us in our place. And then he took his own life up again. And now with great love and grace, he watches over us and goes before us. We're unfamiliar with this kind of love. We're unfamiliar with this kind of grace until we meet Christ. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Our ultimate, our ultimate victory is victory over death, spiritual death. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Bible says that every individual who is without a relationship is, is spiritually dead. They're incapable of knowing God. They're incapable of changing their condition. They're incapable of doing what's necessary to gain a relationship with Christ. Jesus Christ comes and he, he won that victory on the cross and He rose from the dead and He gives us life. Without that, we're defeated and we're without hope. Jesus comes to say to you this morning, I'm the author of life. I'm the giver of life. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you life. I'll give you peace. That's what he'll do. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the, is the only provision for sin. There is no other truth out there that can give us access to heaven. There is no other way. There is no other source of life or means of spiritual life. There is no other way to have a relationship with Christ, with the Father. It's through Christ alone. Every path I go down, every door I open, every course I pursue, no matter what it is in my life, if it is not without, if it's without Christ, it is empty. It is unfulfilling. It is elusive. It will never give to me what it promises. It will be a dead end spiritually in my life every time. It will lead me to a place where I am alienated and separated from God for all eternity. But when I step into a relationship with Christ through faith, I have a relationship with Christ for the first time. He says, I'm the true vine. I'm the source of life. I'm the one who energizes faith. I'm the one who energizes your life. I'm the one who gives you everything you need for life and godliness. He pours into our life all the resources we need, the grace that we need, the love from Him that we need, to be a viable, public, shining testimony for Jesus Christ. He enables transformation. He empowers our ability to be conformed to the image of Christ. That's what He does. Without relationship, we're powerless. Everything that we do is meaningless. Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the very Son of God. He is deity. I am. He is equating Himself with the I am of Exodus when God met Moses for the first time, and God called Moses into leadership to free Israel from Egypt, and Moses says, who, who am I going to tell Pharaoh? Who, what am I going to say to him? Who sent me? And God said to him, tell him the one who sent you is simply this, I am that I am, the all-sufficient one, the uncreated one, the one who is, has authority over all things, that is fulfilled here and seen here in the person of Jesus Christ. When Jesus says, I am, he's equating himself in essence and nature as God with God who was revealed to Moses. Finally, in summary, John shows us this. He transforms our lives. He's the only one who could transform our, our lives. John is, it's all about lives being changed. When we look at John, we see lives being changed. When you were saved, your life has changed. Our life is still being changed because of Christ. Christ is the one who transforms. He changes our life. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you might have life. You might have transformation in Jesus Christ. New life in Christ. That's what it's all about. John the Baptist. We encounter John the Baptist right off the bat. John the Baptist is, he is an unborn nobody. And yet he is, from birth, he is given a purpose that elevates him to a status of, of privilege. He becomes the only human being in history to be the one who introduces the world to Jesus Christ. He becomes the messenger who prepares the way for the ministry of Jesus Christ. With his words, he introduces verbally Jesus Christ to the world. No one else has had that privilege. You know, privilege is a word that we shy away from sometimes. Privilege is a beautiful word. If you know Jesus Christ as Savior this morning, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, you are, you are a person of highest privilege. 
you enjoy a privilege that the world doesn't enjoy. It's not fully realized yet, but it's realized now in a relationship with Jesus Christ. All that we have in Christ is beyond words to, to express. We are privileged beyond measure because of what we have in Christ. You know, one day that privilege is going to be realized in practical, real terms. Every day and through all eternity, we're going to serve the Lord and enjoy the fruit of no sin and the impact of sin in our life. It's going to be removed. And we will be right with God in every moment for all eternity. We will serve Him. And there will be the joy and the peace of God in our life for all eternity. And He will provide for our every need for all eternity. That's privilege, folks. Never shy away from privilege. Privilege isn't, isn't, isn't wrong. It's what we do with that. It's what we do with the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's how we convey that to a world who needs a Savior and grace and love. That is a beautiful thing. John is privileged. Yet with, yet with privilege comes high cost comes high responsibility, comes high accountability. As believers, we are called to represent Jesus Christ. John, we see in Mark chapter 6, verses 24 to 28, John would, would uh, be executed because of his stand for Jesus Christ. His privilege of identity with Christ would lead him to the greatest cost of giving his own life for Christ. He would be beheaded because of his love for Jesus Christ. There will be a cost in your life for identity with Him, but never forget the privilege you have in Christ. That is not a position of arrogance. It is a position of grace and humility because all that we have is because of what Jesus Christ has given to us. We don't deserve any of it. One day, we're going to know. You're going to know. I'm going to know. Boy, what that means. The ultimate promises of God. The disciples were changed. Twelve common men. Judas was an unbeliever. The eleven, just common people, uneducated, fishermen, three sets of brothers, a tax collector who was hated by all of them. He was a Jew who had turned traitor to Jews and worked for Rome. If Simon the Zealot, who was a, a political nationalist, if Simon the Zealot had met Matthew on a dark alley street, he would have potentially killed him. Simon would have immediately hated Matthew from his very core. From his very fiber, he would have hated everything that Matthew was. Jesus Christ yet calls them together, and he forms them together into a bond, into a team, into a group, and he uses them after the resurrection. He uses them before the resurrection. He teaches them the ability to love and forgive and to work together and to, and to represent Jesus Christ above all else. And everything else in our life, the past, the sin, the scars, is, is lost in the grace of Jesus Christ. We become new people. You know, we, the problem is we look at people through the lens of the past, and we can't, we can't for, forgive them for what we see. We, we see their mistakes, and we see their failures, and we see the color of their skin, and we see their social economic status, and we see all this, and we can't forgive, and we can't let go, and we meet Jesus Christ, and He reminds us, I am drawing to myself people from all nations, and we are all trophies of grace in the hands of Christ. And the disciples are exactly that. Andrew says, we have found the Messiah. Philip says, we have found the one that was written of by Moses and the prophets. John says, when he saw Jesus, the empty tomb, he said, and he believed, and Thomas doubted, but then he says, my Lord and my God. And they were all transformed. Of course, Peter is, is the one upon which he takes leadership in, in building this church, but he builds it upon the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Nicodemus has changed. From a man who is fearful in chapter 3, Jesus says, you must be born again. You must, you must be born from above. Transformation must take place from above. Judas is religious. He is spiritual. He is a leader. He is respected, and yet he's a sinner. And he needs a Savior, and Jesus transforms him. And we see at the cross, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, they are secret believers. And yet now they step into the public eye, and they take the, the body of Jesus off of the cross, and they bury him. And I have to believe that Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, came to faith in Christ. We have the Samaritans. We have the Samaritan woman. And we have the village that she goes back to. And, and she is defined by her sin. It marks her life. She's hated. She's an outcast. And then because she's a Samaritan, her people, they are hated and they're outcasts. When Israel was taken into captivity, there were some who were stayed behind. And then the, and then the peoples from those captive nations... Uh, conquering nations were brought into Israel and then there was intermarriage and, and, the, and the Jews who were left behind worshipped the gods of those people and they were hated and yet Jesus comes and he changed their lives and he transformed her life and their life 
and he loved them. She said, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And the people, after they saw Jesus Christ, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we've heard ourselves, and we know that this man is really the Savior of the world. Transformation, that's what that's all about. We see the nobleman. We encountered him uh, earlier this morning. His life has changed. His royal official, his son is healed. He's coming out of desperation, and yet... He is transformed from a, from a place of, of absolute desperation and uncertainty, of, of lack of faith, to a, a person of faith. And he himself believed in all of his household. He begged Jesus to come. His greatest focus was his son, and yet the greatest need of his life was met. It was the condition of his own soul. And he trusted Jesus Christ. He's transformed. We have the 5,000. We have the many. Many in the, that group of 5,000 that were fed by Jesus Christ claimed faith in him, but it wasn't real faith. In fact, that day, that moment, they wanted to make him king. That was, their, that was their goal. It was a political deliverance. And those chapters to come right after that, immediately after that chapter, the next one, many came to know Jesus Christ. You have many who, who made that profession of faith and then turned away from Christ. After this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. But then you have the many here you had others who turned, and many in the crowd put their faith in him, John 7, 31. And they said, this really is the prophet. This is the Christ. And chapter 8, verse 30, and many believed in him. There was a transformation. A man born blind. Jesus didn't just touch his eyes. He touched his soul. He went from, he went from a man who simply says, this man is called Jesus, to this man is a prophet, to this man, if he were not from God, he could do nothing to... To Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. He was, he was moved by faith, and he was transformed. He was given not only physical sight, he was given spiritual sight. Transformed. He was outcast, he was needy. No one could help him until Jesus stepped into his life. Lazarus, he was undeserving of what took place. He needed Christ. He even had a friendship with Jesus Christ. said Jesus loved him. There was a phileo friendship. There was a... There was a genuine friendship between Christ and Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And Lazarus died, and yet then Lazarus was lifted back up, and he became a trophy of grace before the people. And, and many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary to the grave of Lazarus, and seen what Jesus had done, they believed in him. Lazarus and those who saw were transformed. Mary Magdalene. She was the first encounter with her. She's demon-possessed, seven demons. And her life is, is just a wreck. Uh, physical disorders, mental disorders, we don't know what, what the impact was, but her life was a wreck. She was out of control. She was in bondage and could do nothing about it. And Jesus comes and with simply his word, he releases her from bondage and he frees her. He, she devotes the rest of her life in service to him. We see in, in Luke chapter 8, verses 1, 2, and 3, as the disciples are going to minister with Jesus, there are women who go with him, and she's one of them. And she's a wealthy woman, and she helps provide for the, for the financial needs of the disciples and of Jesus through her income. And she's one of the first to see Jesus after he rises from the dead. We are reminded here that Jesus Christ, as he was raised from the dead, he did that that we might walk in newness of life. We are reminded in 2 Corinthians 5, 13, uh, 17, if we're in Christ, we're a new creation. Jesus Christ, when he touches your life, it becomes new. He touches the scars in your life, touches the hurts in your life. He comes to us. He sees, he sees the, the depravity of our life. He sees the mark of sin over everything that, he, that we do. He touches our life, and he washes he washes the stain of that sin away from our life and He cleanses us for the first time. And He gives us the ability to now be overcomers in Him. He gives us the power that we never had before to walk in victory every day. He gives us our love for unlovable people as He loved us. He gives us grace for every moment. The ability to meet every moment in the power of Christ. An ability we never had until we met Christ. He looks into all the things that we've done that have been hurtful and He forgives them. And He just 
He pours over us His grace and His love. And we're transformed. He transforms us. That's what He does. You know, one of the great challenges to, to any of us before we come to Christ is this. Can, can God really change me? I've got stuff in my life. I, can God really love me? Can God really love me? Maybe you're asking that this morning. Jesus Christ, just through the example of these simple people, in this, in the gospel, and so many others in his ministry, he says, "Yes, that's what I came to do. I came to seek and to save the lost, the hurting, the sinful, the thief on the cross. That's why I came." Transformation, he changes us. One of the great barriers to salvation is not only, "Lord, can you do this?" but, "Lord, do I want it?" Do I want Christ to change me? You know, it's like that little cockroach. When you turn that light on, the bug goes, it hates the light. One of the great barriers to salvation is, is we hate the light. Sin in us doesn't want, to, doesn't want to be revealed. Our nature doesn't want to be exposed. When we come to the cross, we are exposed before the eyes of Him who sees all things. And yet in that exposure, we are flooded not only with the condemnation of our sin, but here's the beautiful thing. We are exposed to the light of the one who floods love and grace into our life and washes us from that, from what we should be condemned for. And he washes us and cleanses us and forgives us. And he and he's, brings us into a relationship with us and he wraps his arms around us and he loves us as a son and daughter. And we are transformed forever. This morning my prayer is this, that you will let Christ transform you. At the moment of salvation, let Him change you. Let His grace and love pour into your life, His power. If you're a child of God, one of the great barriers to us being successful as witnesses and testimonies and ambassadors for Jesus Christ is simply this. We won't let Jesus Christ change us. We hold with ferocity onto the things that define us, onto the things that we love and enjoy that, that aren't pleasing to the Lord and we won't let go. But for a child of God, we recognize the need to do that, to be transformed, conformed to the image of Christ. I pray this morning that, that by His grace, you will let the Spirit of God touch your heart this morning. Lord, we thank You for Your work of grace. Thank You, Lord Jesus. You are the very Son of God. You are God in the flesh, deity. And You stepped into this world, and You stepped into, into my life, and You stepped into our lives at the cross, and You won the victory over sin and over death. Now you offer to the whole world forgiveness and cleansing of sin, relationship with the Heavenly Father through faith in you, your work on the cross for our behalf. I pray, Father, that, that we would step into a relationship with you for the first time and receive Jesus Christ as Savior. I pray we that know Christ would let you change us, that we would be conformed to the image of Christ, God, that you would change our will that our will would be this, Lord, you every day. Lord, I live for you today and tomorrow. Lord, bless us with that blessing, the reward and the fruitfulness of that yielded heart. I pray that we would experience that day to day in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining with us, and we'll be with you again next week.